also we have um, it's kind of similar topic ESG uh, rewriting history to the unpredictable past of ESG ratings, and the presenter is Camilia Fabisic. Hello, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. So I will spend the next uh, the next twenty minutes talking about our paper with uh, uh, Florian Bergen Zex Outner. Um, so we we called it rewriting history too because we uh, it's the same company that is rewriting the data that was in the JF paper by um, Lundqvist, Marston, and Malloy. Uh, that's called rewriting history. Um, so let me motivate what what our paper is about. So I don't have to convince you that there has been a massive rise in the importance of ESG um, um, principles in the investment management industry. In fact, um, the assets under management in funds that um, abide by ESG principles have hit the record of 1.7 trillion in 2020. Um, and um, in general, what these funds, but also everybody else is doing to, to measure ESG quality is just to rely on ESG ratings or ESG ratings providers. <coughs> Sorry. So ESG vendors of major ESG ratings our MSCI Sustainalytics, sorry, uh, MSCI Sustainalytics, um, S&P Global, <coughs> Video Iris, or Thomson Reuters Refinitive ESG. Um, now, um, to, to produce an ESG rating, uh, usually uh, all of them uh, rely on the environmental, social, and governance pillars, or SAP scores. <coughs> and these are combined to form these overall ESG score. The overall ESG score uh, is then combined uh, to, um, in this case, uh, so our paper is about the Refinitiv ESG ratings, one of the major ESG ratings providers. So these scores are combined and um, they, they are, the range is between zero, which is a minimum score, and 100, which is a maximum score. And as of November 2020, the state uh, rating provider had a really uh, good data coverage. So they cover 80% of global market cap across 76 countries. The information that they use to uh, produce this rating is collected from publicly available sources. So um, by now I have told you that uh, we um, there has been a rise in, in, the, in, in investing according to these principles. There are multiple uh, rating agencies and um, I provided you a bit more information about one of them, so Refinitiv ESG. Uh, this one has been also known as Asset4. Um, so what we do, uh, we have multiple downloads, but let's first start with two key downloads that led us uh, to the idea for the paper. Uh, so uh, we have downloaded the same set of from your observations at two, and well, multiple, but in this case, different points in time in September 2018 and in September 2020. And this is around 30,000 firm years. And uh, we noticed that there has, um, there has been a major change um, between, um, between these two downloads. Um, and the reason for this, I can already tell you, was that this ratings provider had a major methodology change in April 2020, so between our two downloads. Now, the paper at the moment, as it's written, um, is focusing on this methodology change. However, in the revision that we're preparing, we're focusing on something way more shocking than this, and that is that rewriting has not been a one-time event. We would have expected that um, this methodology change during rewriting in April 2020 was the last time, actually, the historical from your observations for the uh, 2011 to 2017 were changed. However, we can show that this is not the case and that uh, Refinitiv ESG is actually rewriting the ratings almost as often as on a weekly basis. Now, uh, let's first focus on the methodology change. So here I have an example of a company um, uh, where we, uh, so recall that the methodology change was in April, 2020. And this is how the, the data that Florian downloaded looked like in September 2018 for their respective firm years. And then the data that I downloaded in September 2020. Um, it looks similar for, for other firms as well. So on, in our sample, um, the, the score change on average is minus 20.6%. 
and the median is 18.4. So there was an uh, on average a drop. The, major the majority of firms experienced um, a drop and a small, um, I, around 13% experience actually an increase in this absolute scale. So zero is the minimum, 100 is the maximum. Now, if we think about this methodology change, um, the one that became effective in April on April 6, 2020, and there were two uh, key changes. One of them was uh, that the ratings provider changed how it treats um, Boolean metrics. So if you do not report something back in the days, you got the so-called benefit of the doubt. So you got a score of 0 0.5. And so if you were doing something wrong, it was better not to say anything because you would get this benefit of the doubt. Afterwards, uh, to kind of um, motivate, I, th I believe that uh, the company wanted to uh, motivate firms to more transparency, <clears throat> there was a change to a score of zero. Uh, so now it's better to, to report, um, at least if um, uh, in this case. Now, um, the second change is something that we believe is something really major, and that is the introduction of a proprietary materiality matrix. So this matrix is uh, a layer into which we cannot see. And uh, with this layer, the ratings provider um, allegedly accounts for the fact that not every score is the same importance in every industry. Um, we 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 are we don't see into this, and so we we cannot make any statements about the materiality matrix. But the idea behind it was communicated in the methodology change announcement um, um, one month before the um, before it took place. Now we also have a third, and we now by now we have we download every week, uh, but. Let's talk about the third data download. So that one is, um, in my eyes, uh, the most shocking part. Um, so we downloaded data, you know, you see the, the two years, but then also two months after. Uh, so between so September 2018, September 2020, and then November 2020. Um, if we now look into, this is the same company that I showed you, this is just a one, one uh, and we have 6,871 firms in our sample. Um, you can see that, okay, there was a methodology change between September 2018 and September 2020. But then if you look into November 2020, you can see that uh, the rating actually halved, and this is historical rating. We do not find for any for this firm any hints on their ESG quality being deteriorating, uh, or um, we do not find any scandal. Um, uh, and this is the case for many companies for which we see such abrupt changes over a two-month period. Uh, so you see that a rating halved, and also if uh, someone claims that um, that the, maybe the one would like to see if the firm is improving or worsening over time, even that is changing between September 2020 and November 2020. So you would, um, it would look like, for instance, 2013, 14, and if according to September 2020, there would be an improvement in the, in the quality, uh, whereas it's, it's more minor, uh, or in some cases, even it looks like a worsening of, of quality. So this is uh, an example of a major unannounced rewriting that happened and that we uncover in our paper. Uh, now let's, uh, so now that I showed you all these changes in ratings, uh, let me tell you what we study. So we are absolutely the first to document uh, and analyze these large retroactive rewritings in ESG ratings. Um, we provide answers um, to what are the economic drivers and what are their economic consequences? As I said, at the moment, we focus in the paper more on the methodology change, um, but as we are rewriting the paper now, we're going to focus uh, more on the this unannounced, um, unannounced uh, rewritings that are happening on a weekly basis. Um, so what we show, well, let's, when we talk about the, what the methodology change resulted in, we show that changes in these ratings affect tests, for instance, that relate ESG ratings to stock returns. 
uh, we only look at uh, at a couple of studies. So um, to to solidify the importance of our paper, we provide um, also a figure in which we show that more than one thousand two hundred papers um, have been written um, uh, that that use asset for data. Uh, so this is the year produced in September um, twenty twenty. Uh, so we, we all filtered for, so usually when one speaks of Refinitiv ESG data, one, one uh, also relates to the old name. So it's Refinitiv ESG, also known as SS4. And that's why we, we focus on that in this figure. Um, now, let me uh, tell you a bit about the main results. So we show that uh, the ESG score deviations really strongly affect the classification of firms into different ESG quantiles. And this is something we really often use uh, in research, but also in the investment practice. Now, in all tested settings, we find really strong evidence, for instance, that high environmental and social firms exhibit better stock market performance relative to low ENS firms using their written data, but not using the initial data. So that goes back to the previous paper where uh, we might be um, discussing as much as we want, but some companies can just uh, change it and introduce or make it disappear. Um, so we demonstrate that this rewriting is not a one-time event and that Refinity VFG continues to adjust the data exposed, but this time in an unannounced manner. Um, if I show you about a bit about the data, as I said, we have around 30,000 firm years, so 29,828. Um, there have also been some deletions and additions. Uh, we do not find any systematic reason for why that is the case. Uh, I'm just presenting the data as is. So we focus on the fiscal years 2011 to 2017. Now, um, let, that, let us um, uh, talk a tiny bit more about the economic drivers of this. So we did, did uh, take a very close look. Um, we do find that, for instance, in the revision in the, uh, if we speak about the methodology change, the revision in what Refinitiv VSG uh, thinks of uh, governance quality is driven a lot by the country effect. Um, but we still, even after a re really thorough variance decomposition and inclusion of many fixed effects, we are left actually with um, a large unexplained fraction. And so we look into uh, firm level variables and if these can explain ESG score rewritings. So they, um, I will show you in the next slide that firm characteristics do not have uniform effects across all three ESG subscores. Some have a positive effect on one subscore, but a negative effect on another score, except for youth returns. So um, firms experiencing higher past returns experience a positive rewriting, for instance, of their environmental and social subscores, and the effect is stronger for the social subscore. Um, we still, uh, even after this analysis, our overall adjusted R score is below 50%, and so large parts of the variations uh, remain unexplained. So let's have a look. Um, um, you can see that um, many variables seem to play uh, Seem to play a role, but the signs are many times, you know, positive for one, um, so environmental, social, and governance pillar, um, but negative for the other, or negative for the aggregate, uh, or, or the other way around for the for the aggregate. Um, however, the the return might have so the past dog return. Um, well, we don't want to make many any accusations, but the past dog return is positively related with the um, magnitude of the rewriting. Uh, now, what are the economic consequences? So the economic consequences are actually far reaching. So now I'm showing you a, a usual table, um, or well, we usually would focus on, let's say, top ESG, um, so top core dial of ESG score firms, or um, one would exclude the bottom hairstyle or decile and so on. So that's, that is why I'm showing you this uh, this um, table uh, for Comparison purposes, we focus on S&P 1500 firms because they're um, the, the uh, well, the, the firms within are uh, are more comparable than if we included the entire sample. So 
So um, something that one would commonly use, let's say top quartile of uh, according to ESG score, the overlap between the old, between the pre-methodology change and post-methodology change data is only 82.7%. Uh, something that is also commonly experienced in, let's say, top decile, according to environmental and social score, there almost a bit, a bit more than a half of firms would be the same if you use the old versus if you use the new rating. Um, we also can show that actually stock returns, uh, um, so the tests that relate to stock returns and, uh, stock returns and ESG uh, ratings are impacted to a large extent. So if one uses the rewritten data, you would conclude that there's outperformance of uh, firms that have high ENS score. So ENS is just environmental and social score. It's the average of the two scores or two pillar scores. And there would be no outperformance uh, using the initial data. So let, let's have a look. So in this figure, we um, we take a, one paper um, that, it, um, that uses a, a difference in differences analysis, um, exogenous COVID-19 market crash. And we show that if you use the rewritten data, it will lead you to conclude that high ENS firms uh, weathered the storm of uh, COVID-19 crash better than, uh, than, than those that are not um, um, in the top quartile of uh, ENS score. Whereas if you use the initial data, no such uh, um, conclusion would be, would be possible. Now, we also show this on panel data. So now we have all firms, um, we have all uh, firm years that we have uh, in our sample for which we have control observations. And again, uh, now we form, well, now this analysis is produced in a way that you invest in, um, so you invest in a certain period, and then the future stock return is the one that, that is uh, realized after you, you've, uh, you form your portfolio. And again, if we looked at e and our, so initial data, there would be no outperformance. Uh, whereas if you looked at rewritten data, again, you would find um, a significant economically and statistically significant effect. The same is for the the, the higher the re, or the greater the rewriting, the more the stronger the effect. Now, I would like to tell you about these ongoing and unannounced rewritings of ESG scores. Um, so we show that the, the methodology change was not a one-time thing and that Refinity VHD actually adjusts the data exposed but without announcing it to the public. And as I already told you, we have this date in November 2020 download. So this was, we, we compared just the September and November period. And we, again, we find that the classification of firms into uh, so quantiles, so deciles, quartiles, terciles is again impacted. Now, uh, what, we, um, what we show in the paper is that we have this ESG rating provider that is really commonly used um, that had a methodology change, but not only that, that, that this methodology change severely affects tests that relate ESG ratings to stock returns. But then uh, even more importantly, that it's not a one-time event and the, conti the company continues to adjust the data exposed in an unannounced way. So what does this mean for us? So for researchers and investment professionals, we need to uh, verify whether we need the original and not the rewritten ESG data to perform our text, uh, tests. Um, for example, if practitioners are unaware of these changes, SM managers could erroneously be benchmarked against the rewritten data that were actually unavailable at a portfolio formation and thus introducing the look-ahead bias. Uh, since uh, the industry is likely to grow, it's a... Uh, it's a caveat towards the use of these this data set. But now let's uh, let's speak uh, for one more minute about what we also have. We also have now total ESG scores. So this is for the next steps. Um, uh, total ESG scores from February 2020 and also granular data. Um, I will uh, spend the, the one minute I have to answer the first question. So has Refinity been rewriting historical ratings also prior to April 2020? Uh, and then um, sorry, and then uh, the, the answer is that yes, um, it has been the company even prior to the methodology change in April 2020 uh, has, um, has been rewriting data. We do not know uh, on, at what frequency yet. And so, um, in fact, what I showed you, these 1,200 studies, actually many more studies relying, relying on total ESG scores are likely to be impacted. So if you look at February 2020, 
you can see that um, these scores are not the same uh, with uh, September 2018. And um, so while the changes look minimal, if you look at the year 2014, now it's 71.75 and then 78.62, which is a quite, quite a big change. So uh, let me skip this part. Also, one, one last thing. Also, the granular data has been changing. Sorry. So 67% so of sorry uh, CO2 emissions total um, have in some way been altered. Um, so I would like to thank you for your attention. And I, I went just a bit over time. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Komelia. Uh, the discussion is Hao Liang from Singapore Management University. Hao Liang, it's all yours. Uh, OK. Uh, thank you. I hope everybody can see my slides uh, yes. for giving me the uh, opportunity to discuss this interesting paper. And uh, let me quickly summarize uh, this paper. So the authors uh, find that uh, Refinitiv ESG, formerly known as Asset Form, one of the major ESG rating agencies, uh, retrospectively rewrites its historical ESG data. And this is on an ongoing basis, often without announcing these changes to the public. Uh, the authors further find that there seem to be some patterns in Refinitiv's rewriting based on the author's two downloads that happened in September uh, 2018 and September uh, 2020. So they find majority of the sample observations, they were downgraded uh, in, the, in the ESG rating. And this rewriting is associated with past uh, stock returns, especially for uh, E and S stop scores, uh, with firm size, with sales growth, profitability, R&D, et cetera. But the direction of the effect varies across different uh, sub scores. So sometimes it positively affects uh, the E score and sometimes the negatively affects the S scores. So the authors also did a event study and uh, they find when Refinitiv announced the change in its uh, methodology uh, around March or April 2020, uh, firms which were upgraded, uh, they have a positive uh, announcement returns, whereas firms that were downgraded, they have an active announcement returns. Um, and they further find and argue that this uh, uh, retroactive ESG score rewriting by Refinitiv can lead to large uh, changes in what are deemed to be high ESG firms and low ESG firms can also lead to uh, exaggeration on the benefits of being, in a high, uh, of being a high ESG firm during crisis, such as the recent uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. So uh, my overall assessment, uh, I fully agree with the authors and with many other people that Refinitiv ESG and many other ESG ratings, they have a lot of problems. Uh, that's also why uh, many of the major asset uh, managers, including BlackRock, cited by the paper, uh, they no longer use Refinitiv and don't, they no longer use third-party ESG ratings, but they began to develop their own uh, in-house ratings. Uh, in addition, I'm not entirely sure uh, whether the author's critique are the right problems uh, to focus on. I will shortly explain. So my comments will be around the following four uh, points. Uh, first, how the ESG ratings are constructed. Second, whether we should interpret the results as a rewriting or as a recalibrating. Uh, third, uh, what's the incentive for Refinitiv, the reader, to rewrite its ESG scores? And fourth, uh, the contribution of the paper and where we are hiding uh, at this stage. So first, how are the ratings constructed? Different ESG rating agencies, they typically use different uh, rating methods. Some use the so-called basing class. Uh, I will explain this term shortly, including Refinitiv. Uh, others use lighter grade rating, uh, such as from AAA to C. So MSCI use this one. Uh, many papers uh, uh, use KLD, and now it's called MSCI ESG stat, which use a strength minus concerns aggregation. So they count how many good things you did and how many bad things you did. So on the aggregate, you know, uh, uh, what's your uh, total uh, number of good versus bad, uh, bad things. Uh, there is also a convergence of uh, rating methodology across different agencies. This is partially due to the whole rating industry's uh, consolidation. For example, a few years ago, KLD was acquired by MSCI. So the methodology change uh, uh, to the uh, um, <clears throat> ladder grid system. And true cost uh, two years ago was acquired by uh, SMP Global. 
So since this paper is about refinitive, uh, let me comment on refinitive. So refinitive use a Bayesian class approach in its reading. So what is a Bayesian class? Uh, so if I'm a, I'm a professor, I wanna, I wanna form a team uh, to be my research assistant, then what I will do is I probably pick the students on my class who scored the highest in their final exam. So I pick the best students in my class. So this is also what refinitive does. Uh, so refinitive will rank out the firms uh, in their sample and they pick the firms, uh, they, rank, uh, they give the score based on your relative or percentile uh, ranking uh, across the whole uh, uh, sample. Uh, this also means that uh, the score will be recalculated when there are new companies added into the sample, which is the case. So refinitive uh, over time uh, is adding more and more companies in your sample. So because of this nature, and because your score is your relative ranking, so the company's ESG score can move up or down purely depending on how it is compared with the newly added company. So if the newly added company does better in ESG than you, then you will be automatically downgraded, not because you did something wrong, but just because they are better students than you. So such addition of the companies is usually due to index inclusion, and that's also uh, and, but the ranking is always between zero to 100. So that's also why the medium score change zero uh, percent as the authors find. So it's always around 50. This is by uh, construction. So uh, I got this picture from a uh, uh, Refinitiv's uh, uh, data manual, basically showing you how they add more and more companies uh, into their sample over time. When Refinitiv started in 2003, they have a relatively small uh, uh, set of uh, uh, equity indices, but over the recent years, especially in the years that when the authors download the data, there are more and more equity indices added into, into the sample. And they don't uh, add everything uh, uh, at one time, they probably take time, take a few weeks uh, or even months uh, to add more and more companies. And because your EIG score is your relative uh, ranking, so the score will uh, uh, be automatically uh, readjusted. So this is the mechanism. Uh, also, uh, ESG ratings are adjusted based on some benchmark. According to Refinitiv, I uh, use their uh, data for my own research as well, so I make a lot of phone calls to them as well. Uh, their ESG scores are industry adjusted. Uh, sorry, their E and S scores are industry adjusted, uh, and their G scores are country adjusted. That means uh, it's not uh, reasonable to compare the environmental score between an uh, oil and gas company with a hotel company. It's only sensible to compare the E score between two companies in the same industry, and that's what Refinitiv uh, does, and to compare the governance quality between two companies in the same country because they uh, 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 share the same corporate law uh, and governance system. This is also consistent with the findings uh, when the authors uh, test on the variance decomposition uh, of the uh, deviation in ESG scores. As newly added equity indices, they disproportionately represent industries and countries. Uh, I think it is unsurprising that the changes in the ESG subscores do not coincide in the direction. Some you know, uh, 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 move positively, some move negatively, and they also do not coincide in their magnitude. So my suggestion would be uh, to reconcile the rewriting pattern that you document with the pattern of new indices and new companies being added into the sample. Uh, I actually suggest you to directly call a uh, Refinitiv. Uh, I call them probably more than 20 times over the past few years. Uh, I feel it's more, uh, always more efficient to understand if uh, we wanna accuse someone, we have to give uh, uh, this person an opportunity to explain what they did. Uh, also to separate the adjustment, uh, either it's a uh, uh, fixed effects or uh, demeaning uh, at the industry level for E and S scores and adjustment uh, uh, in country uh, for the G scores in your analysis because uh, they use different uh, benchmarks. Uh, my second comment is about whether this is a rewriting or recalibrating. So the idea is, or the question is whether this uh, retrospective ESG rating adjustment appropriate. Uh, the authors argue ex post score changes are systematic, uh, partially driven by reassessment of the industry and the country level drivers of ESG risks and are related to firm characteristics. And my question is, shouldn't this be the case? To me, I think it is logical to recalibrate ratings 
over time, as I receive more and more information, because I want my reading to be more and more accurate. And recalibrating based on observables can go either direction, which is also consistent with the evidence uh, that the authors document uh, in uh, table five. Uh, that means the, the effects vary across different uh, subscores. So to me, I think the real question is, as users, including us as researchers, whether the current rating that we have on hand, which probably dated back to 2020, can better predict future stock returns. So the key word here is better. That means whether the rating quality actually increased in terms of predicting something. And whether the majority of the ESG scores, uh, uh, they are downgraded uh, continuously, or whether they sort of, uh, 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 they are mean reverting. So my suggestion would be, I know the author is already downloads uh, from Refinitiv many times, although the focus is on two times downloads. Uh, so maybe you can uh, download uh, uh, on a higher frequency and see if the predictive power of EAG scores on future stock returns get stronger and stronger uh, over time. So my third comment is, you know, when you present this evidence to me, I began to ask, so what's the incentive for the readers to rewrite their uh, readings? Uh, and this touch on uh, actually a, a very uh, uh, important question because there are many papers talking about the agency problem of rating agencies uh, during the financial crisis because those rating agencies, mostly providing bond ratings, they adopt a issuer paid model. And so basically they are paid uh, by the people that they gave their ratings to. Whereas ESG ratings, they usually use a investor paid model. So that means uh, Refinitiv is not paid by the company that they gave rating to, but they are paid by uh, BlackRock and maybe other institutional investors as well as uh, researchers like, uh, like us. So many studies after the financial crisis, the last financial crisis, they consider the investor paid model being preferred because it solves the conflict of interest problem in the issuer paid model. So I think this may be a potential direction uh, 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 to answer an even more impo uh, important and interesting question. So from rating agencies' perspective, uh, they may want to convince investors that their ESG ratings are useful. That's why they want to rewrite. So this is another type of uh, a conflict of interest or another type of agency problem. So this may be the reason that uh, the rewritten ESG ratings are hardwired with uh, stock returns as the authors document uh, in their paper. So my suggestion would be uh, a potential angle uh, of the study, rather than saying I find a problem in the rating, is to explore the incentive of readers to change their rating under, their, uh, under this investor paid model and uh, consider whether this is another type of agency problem by, agent, uh, by rating agencies, uh, that is, you know, they wanna cater to investors taste by arbitrarily uh, changing their ratings. My last comment is related to the contribution of the paper. I know that whenever a discussion comments on contribution, this is usually uh, sometimes fruit upon, but given that the authors I noticed uh, uh, cited four of my uh, papers, I think I'm allowed to comment a little bit on the uh, contribution. So we already know there are many, many problems with ESG ratings. For example, it's really not directly comparable between different uh, ESG metrics. Uh, there is a size bias, larger firms usually receive higher ratings. There is reporting bias, so the companies which have the resources to report their ESG, uh, they get higher ratings. And there is already an inconsistency in methodology, uh, which results in a co uh, low correlation, as low as 30% between different ratings. Uh, the, the picture on the right is from uh, the Economist uh, uh, magazine, which documents many of these problems. So to me, I think this paper answers the question that one major rating agencies uh, also change its historical data without notifying the users. So my question is whether this funding is significant enough, given that many other problems are already well documented, and the fact that more and more asset managers, including Black Rocks, uh, they are developing their own ratings. They are getting away from the, the, the third-party rating agencies. So to me, I think the more interesting questions would be, as researchers, should we triangulate our analysis with different ESG ratings, which is, by the way, recommended by a, a 2016 uh, SMJ paper. And that's also what I do with basically all my uh, papers. If I don't trust Refinitiv, 
I run the same type of regressions across at least three different regions. Is this the solution? I'm not sure, but uh, at least this is uh, you know what I can do for the moment. Do other rating agencies also rewrite their historical data such that what this, this, the problem the author identify in this paper is actually quite prevalent? And are the consequence of ESG score rewriting of similar magnitudes as that of other problems, such as there's a lack of uh, standards, there's a size bias, there's disagreements uh, between readers. To me, these are more probably more important questions. So uh, I want to end this by commenting a little bit on where are we heading. Uh, what I'm going to say later on may be uh, highly subjective. It only reflects my own opinion, and many people may not uh, agree with me. So to me, I think it's not difficult to find problems, especially with the new data. And as someone who started working on this uh, uh, topic on ESG, uh, by using those ESG ratings when I was a PhD student, uh, I was well, well, well aware of uh, many of the problems, including the uh, rewriting uh, issue. But I also strongly believe that you know, as researchers, we should start somewhere to make progress and then refine our measures our methodologies uh, over time. As more than 40 trillion US dollars are invested in ESG issues globally, I think it's more important to understand where we should be heading beyond finding problems. So in my opinion, we need a more objective, transparent, and scientific frameworks for measurement, not only giving ESG ratings, but actually to measure the impact of a firm's ESG behavior. And combine these measurements with many policy frameworks for example, uh, we have UN SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. In EU, there is EU taxonomy. There is a sustainable finance disclosure regulation, non-financial uh, reporting directives, and more recently, uh, European Commission also issued the uh, uh, corporate sustainability reporting directives. And there are also many other reporting and disclosure frameworks, such as SASB. Uh, you know all these acronyms. Uh, if you are interested. Uh, feel free to look them up. It will be uh, uh, too time consuming for me to spell them out. So all these point to the direction that we can have a, probably a better framework, which goes beyond... Um, how long your time's up, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I will list it here uh, to highlight, you know, what uh, can we do uh, uh, moving forward in terms of better measuring uh, impact measurement. And uh, here at SMU, we also did some project with uh, uh, some local banks. And uh, we are, including myself, uh, now developing this impact measurement framework. And with this discussion, I also invite authors and many other people who are interested uh, in this area to join us to do something uh, that is more transparent and more uh, objective uh, to improve uh, investment accuracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Haoliang. Um, I think I'll give one minute for res quick response, just yes. overall, yeah. Yes, thank you so much for the discussion. So we are already heading in most directions that you outlined. So we're downloading Emily every week. Yes, I call them, mail them. Uh, so yes, I have been uh, in touch a lot with Refinitiv. What I really liked was about the incentives. So we believe that um, obviously a product like that sells better if it's linked to, um, if one can show that, oh, look, my rating is linked to returns. Uh, you might have a broader customer base. Um, so let me um, uh, let me uh, look at the questions. Uh, so first was, which one ES or G has more or less rewriting? So in fact, all of them uh, all of them get rewritten, but there is more uh, wiggle room for E and S since we uh, with the governance is kind of uh, you know the number of the uh, you know in the with the directors on the board and so. Uh, and the, I have to say, one cannot adjust the proprietary matrix uh, as easily as one can uh, do it for the ENS. So my answer would be ENS. Uh, then the, the next question, um, uh, so we now also have granular data and um, we, uh, we do not see that the rewriting is occurring be because uh, many uh, values are being added where they were missing in the past. In fact, for instance, the firm that I showed you has very little change on the granular level, and yet it, uh, its ESG rating dropped by, um, well, dropped to half of what it was um, in this unannounced um, period. 
Uh, then uh, Refinitiv, um, da, 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 so Refinitiv is mainly targeting investors and asset managers to simply check the current ESG rating of a subset of firms. Does uh, your result mean that Refinitiv is catering to the interests of its largest group of customers? So I would, I would, uh, my answer would be yes. Um, and now the last question, going back uh, to Hao Liang's uh, point regarding additional stock index, perhaps stock index that are added to those that have performed well in terms of financial returns. This may result in the pre-existing stock index that was having both relatively lower ESG scores and lower returns. So I would, um, I think this is a this is a very good, uh, very good point, uh, and this is something that could be happening as well. So the, the our punchline is that. Uh, one, one last, um, maybe um, maybe I can say something for 30 seconds, that even the granular data is subject to changes. So for instance, the variable that we use often in, you know, in climate finance, CO2 emissions total, um, that has been changed for 67% of data points. And now you're wondering, really have different number of emissions been changed and like emitted between 2011 and 2017 over a two month period? Uh, like it has our information changed so much. I I do not have an answer for that. Do you, so, do you have any idea about the impact on flows to these some of these funds? You know, do they, is, is there any real impact of this? Not the mechanical change that Hao Liang mentioned, but sort of like the deliberate change that you think uh, is done by the provider. Does that affect the flows to some of these funds? Right. This is on our to-do list for for this week. So we will we are definitely uh, going to inspect this. And also, if it maybe leads to an excessive churn rate, like if they're changing in two week, two month period, is there maybe excess movement of funds because there would be a response to that? So this is also an economic effect that uh, right. we not looked at. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I think we kind of managed to catch up on the time, so we'll take a break here. Uh, we'll come back at 4.45 for the next paper. So we'll see you back at 4.45. Thank you. <laughs>